Greetings from the Cary Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders here at Cary, I would like to welcome both our visitors and church family members to our online worship service. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has led governments around the globe to take measures that could mitigate the spread of the virus, and that would include both our local and state governments here in North Carolina. These measures have caused, caused the Cary elders to move our physical worship services to an online format. Our thoughts from the beginning of the implementation of these measures have always been to ensure we continue to worship God in spirit and in truth, which includes to ensure that we sing together, that we have the observation of the Lord's Supper, that we're praying together, that we're giving back to God, and we're also taking the opportunity to hear lessons about God's loving message. This is the reason we're using, this was the reason we were using recorded messages in the beginning, to ensure that we all that, that we always do things the way that God has prescribed them. As we go forward, we are working to make our worship services more personal, more live. During our worship services now, each week we're gonna have Larry present new lessons that he is recording. We will have men lead us in prayers, and one of the, the men will also lead us in a, a prayer for the observation of the Lord's Supper and giving back. I'd like to take the, a few moments to call out to the church family that we're still worshiping God and in, in doing our worship service, where we're going before the throne of God. So please ensure your hearts are focused in the right direction and that we're paying God the proper reverence as we bow down in our worship, even though we are in our homes. Please keep our church family in your prayers and continue to reach out to one another as any loving family would. Please also pray that the world will find a cure for COVID-19 and that we can get back together as soon as possible. Also, let us remember those family members of ours that have recently lost family members and pray for those who are at higher risk of getting the disease. Let us also pray for the spiritual strength and growth of one another. Let us also pray that we take advantage of every opportunity to tell someone about God. Let us go to God in prayer as we open up our worship service. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've had to come, that we have to come together and worship you. We pray, Father, that we can set aside the cares of the world and focus on your throne. We ask you to be with each member of our congregation and that we will take the time throughout the week to ensure that, uh, that to, to reach out to one another and ensure that we're doing fine. We also ask you, Father, to be with the church globally, Father, that all of us will be taking advantage of the opportunities we have to tell someone about you. We also ask you, Father, that we can grow stronger even though this situation is taking place now, Father, for we know you're in control. We love you, and it's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. Good morning. First song this morning will be number 430. 430. Let's stand together.
Please be seated. 336. Is it for me? Our lives, dear Father, are in your hand. 
Father God, we love you and we thank you. And we pray that you'll continue to help us, not only today and through this crisis that we're dealing with, dear Father, but help us to always be servants of yours first and foremost. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray and we ask all things. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 359. Number 359. Now come to this portion of our worship service where we gather around the table as we're instructed to and give an example by in God's word. We do this on the first day of every week as we're led to, as we're exampled by, and as Christians what we really focus on at this time for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf each and every one of us. It's a very personal time as we reflect on that moment that God gave his only son for each and every one of us individually and collectively now as we gather together to commune. We have instruction and example by this in Luke from our Lord himself right before he was to be taken away. You'll find this in Luke chapter 22 and beginning in verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I shall not eat it until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he received a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide among yourselves. For I say unto you, I shall not drink from henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, as we're getting ready to do. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave them to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. At this time, I'll offer a prayer for the bread. Please bow with me.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for all the many blessings that you give to us every day. We thank you for this time that we gather together, that we commune with one another, we reflect, we think, we think back, and we purpose in our hearts as we remember that sacrifice. And Father, now as we share in this bread that represents to us as Christians your son's body, we ask that each and every one of us will take this in most seriousness and we'll take it with clean hands and clean hearts. Help us to remember and to be thankful. In Christ's name I pray, amen. And now, as we get ready to partake of the fruit of the vine, I'll continue reading from Luke 22 in verse 20. And the cup in like manner after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, even that which is poured out for you. This to us as Christians, again, represents the blood of Jesus. That blood that covers us, that blood that cleanses us, and makes us whole again and pure in the sight of the Father, God. Let us again give thanks. Continuing our prayer, Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for having the foresight to institute this, this Lord's Supper, this communion, this time to gather around and to share. And Father, just as we've just partaken of the bread, we also now focus on that blood of your Son that covers us. This fruit of the vine that represents to us as Christians that blood. We ask that each and every one of us would partake with clean hands and clean hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Also, another vital part of our worship is our giving, and that continues even today. We as the body here at the Cary Church of Christ, each time we gather on Sunday, the first day of the week, we take up a collection. So the work that the elders here have decided we would participate in would be funded, and we give of our means. We give as we've been blessed, and we're told to do it cheerfully and joyfully. And that should be something that should be very, very easy for all of us because we are so blessed, so blessed. So we'd like to offer prayer for our giving. And we take a moment to be thankful for all of our blessings. And it's not just our monetary blessings or our homes or our food or those kind of things, but the blessings of each other and our fellowship and the tools and resources that God gives us all to share his good news with others. So let us pause for a moment and be thankful for our giving. Heavenly Father, we are again so thankful for all the many blessings of this life that you give to us. We are thankful certainly for our homes and our food and families and jobs that we can go to and work and provide for our families. And then infinitely more than that, so many blessings that you provide to us each and every day. Father, we're thankful for the fellowship that we enjoy with one another. and We pray that that will always continue and we'd be united in your Son. Help the funds that are collected today to be used to further your kingdom. They would be used wisely. And Father, we just pray that in some way the things that we do and we give back will help to expand your kingdom. Most of all, giving of our time and our love and our hearts to each other, reaching out to one another and those in their need. Help us to be mindful of those things and each and every day count our many blessings. In Christ's name I pray, amen. For the lesson this morning, we'll sing number 572. Number 572. Let's stand again as we sing.
There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless flame. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine. Shore to shore, send the light. The blessed gospel light. shepherd I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our world as we know it has forever changed. And during those difficult times, as we struggle to find answers, it helps us to know that God's word is there for us. There are powerful places in scripture that are personal to us, and I think Psalm 23 is one of those. If you notice in the book of Psalm, in verse 23, there are no references to we or us or they, but only my, me, and I, and you. This is David's testimony. By his personal experience with God, David is pouring out his heart and sharing with us exactly who God is and who God was for him. With simple beauty, it speaks of green pastures and still waters, as well as dark valleys and even speaks of enemies. And so David is pouring his art out and expressing the concept of who God is and how God is the one who carried him through difficult times. I think we are in a time of distress, but I think also that we can find confidence in times of distress because of who we are as God's children. One of my favorite Bible verses is 1 John 3, 1, which reads, Behold what manner of love God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Of God, And there is no greater blessing than to be a child of God. But I think what can help us the most as we look through the book of Psalms, and that's what I want to spend for just a few moments today. If you're watching today and if you're worshiping with us today online, thank you for tuning in. If you're not part of the body here at Cary, but you're still joining us for worship, I'm so grateful that you're here. And I certainly want you to know that I'm praying for you and your family as we go forward to deal with this crisis. God is our confidant. God is the one with whom we can lean upon, and that's what we need to do during these times today. But I want you to notice how confident and personal David is as David begins his psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. So David is stressing the concept of 
first knowing who God is, that God is his shepherd as the one who's leading him through the difficulties of this life, the one who's watching over him. David said, I have that personal relationship with God. God is my shepherd. Today, can you say that God is your shepherd? Is God leading you at this very moment? Are you trusting in him and putting your trust in him? However, if you look at verses 4 and 5, David then shifts, referring to him in the second person. It's interesting that we note that transition of how David changes from saying that God is my shepherd to saying, your rod, your staff, they comfort me, you anoint my head with oil. So David shifts from the personal to the second person. But why does David switch from talking about God to talking to God? The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Personally, David said, God is my God. But also at the same time, God's, David says, as I'm going through these difficulties, I'm looking to God for the answers to get me through the personal and problems of my life. Well, I think we have to remember that we're more prone to talk about God when we're in green pastures and more prone to talk to God when we're struggling in life. Maybe it's the case that right now you've prayed a lot and you've talked to God. If you have that relationship with him as you bow your head in times of distress, never does a man stand so tall that when he bows before God in prayer. And perhaps you, like me, have prayed a lot during these times because sometimes the only thing that I know to do in times of distress is talk to God. I can find comfort in knowing that he's listening to me. So in the light, when we're more prone to wander and wander off in pursuit of greener pastures, in the darkness it seems more than that we cling to God because of what God did for us. So I want to invite you to this familiar oasis this morning as we open up God's word, as we look at Psalm chapter 23, and we're going to see that God is closer than you think in these times of distress. We have to remember that God allows us time in the valley. In the first four verses of Psalm 23, David paints this gentle picture of the shepherd for us. He tells us who God is with his sheep to describe this relationship that God has with us. The Lord is my shepherd. David knows who God is in relation to his relationship. He knows how God has taken care of him. But I want to ask you that same question now. Do you know that God is your shepherd? Is God leading you at this moment? Can you put your trust in who he fully is? Everything makes sense from the understanding of a shepherd leading his flock. And this is how David is looking at the shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's going to lead me through this difficulty of life. He's going to watch over me. But then we get to verse 4, and that same concept, that same relationship doesn't fit. Because David then says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When you think about the valley of the shadow of death, it conjures up these these thoughts or these, these images of this dangerous situation where a sheep's life is in jeopardy unless the shepherd is watching over it. But it's also interesting to think about the concept that the sheep, even though he walks through this valley of the shadow of death, he says, I don't fear anything because God is walking with me. He has confidence in the shepherd because he knows the shepherd is looking over him he's watching over him it doesn't mean that we stop paying attention but it also means that we can have confidence during this time of distress and crisis and knowing that God is walking with us so even when we face difficulties in life and uncertainties it should bring us comfort in knowing that God is with us even when I'm walking in the valley and times are hard and scary God is leading me to some better place I often say that you can't appreciate the view from the top of the mountain until you've been through the valley. Right now, we're in the valley. And even as the shepherd is leading us to the valley, he's taking us to the high country. As predators take cover over cliffs, and those valleys can be subject to sudden storms and flash floods during that particular part of the country, in spite of those hazards, God turns himself to his sheep to watch over them. And so when you're walking... Through some unfamiliar valley, everything seems daunting. There's something that I want you to remember today. Your shepherd is leading you. He's not behind you pushing you. He's leading you and looking back and taking care of you. And you could rest assured that he's going to take you to a better place. We just have to remember that we trust him. Everything, every valley is a pathway to something better. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, David said, I'm not worried about where I'm walking. Can we say that we're not worried right now? Probably not. Most of us are anxious. The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing, but it's easy for us to be anxious with something that we cannot see that's threatening us. And so it helps us to understand that even no matter what might happen, as I walk through that valley of the shadow of death, I can put my trust in who God is. The psalmist says in Psalm 84 and verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So how are you walking today? And to whom are you looking? Is God your shepherd leading you through the valley of difficulties at this moment? Or are you doing it on your own? You see, because if we do it on our own, then we feel alone as we walk through the valley. If you think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, how he was struggling as he left the father to go off into the, the far country to what he thought was a better life. Eventually, he wastes all of everything of his inheritance, and now he's in want. He's even feeding pigs and says, you know what, this is better than nothing. I'll just eat what the pigs are eating. Well, he stopped watching for the father, and he thought he could do it on his own. And so what the shepherd is telling us, that God is going to allow us time in the valley to make sure that we're looking to the shepherd. So today you have to make sure that you're looking to the shepherd. But also understand this, God always has us covered. God is always has our back, so to speak. The shepherd has you covered. How do you fight fear when you don't know what's going to happen next? That's the question probably most of us are asking today. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring or the next week or even the next month because of the uncertainties that we're facing right now. And I bet you if, if I were a betting person and I'm not, your imagination is working overtime. David tells us that we have to put our confidence in God. And I think David also tells us that confidence comes from three sources. The first thing that David says is that he stayed in God's presence. It's easy for us, just like the prodigal, to walk away when everything seems to be going okay. But notice the transition and the growth and how the prodigal son grew in understanding that really everything he needed was in God. Everything that he needed was in his father, so he knew where he had to go back to. Sometimes we have to remember that we've got to stay in God's shadows. We've got to watch where God is walking, and his word tells us exactly where he's walking. He's walking the straight path of righteousness. And so he stayed in God's presence. In verse 4, David speaks of God's nearness, of his presence. God was always around watching over him. And so when you step into your valley and you can't see where you're walking, your shepherd has something that he wants you to hear. I will be with you. And so that in and of itself should help to calm our fears, to help settle our anxieties in knowing that God is walking with us every step of the way. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, it says, For he himself has said... I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do unto me. Let me say that again. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Hebrew writer says, nothing about man scares me because of who God is to me. And so there's no valley, no matter how deep or how dark that valley is for you right now, that you can get up and you don't have to do it alone. The second thing is that David saw God's power. When we read about the shepherd's rod, we picture the shepherd's power wielded against overpowering enemies. And during those times, as the shepherd was watching over his flock, predators were looking as to the sheep as prey. But the shepherd was paying attention. And so David had no fear and adversity because of the comfort of God's power in protecting him. In 1 John 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so David understood the power of God through his presence, because God was always with him. The third thing that David saw was that he experienced God leading him. Your staff comforts me, David said. This was the shepherd's staff that had that hook on the end. We often see the pictures or the paintings portraying the shepherd standing with that staff with that crook on the end. The purpose of the crook was to pick the sheep up if it had fallen into a crevice. And so if the sheep had stumbled away or wandered away from the flock or had fallen down, that staff was used to pick the sheep up and to set it back on the path 
and put it with the rest of the flock. David felt comforted because he knew the shepherd had the staff. He knew the shepherd was going to guide him in his steps, making sure that he made it through that valley safely. And so when we lean upon God and understanding that He's walking with us, even as we're traversing difficult times, even when we have uncertainties and we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold for us, we know that God is walking with us, He's watching over us, and He's taking care of us. Psalm 119, 105 again says, The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. It's guiding us. It's showing me exactly where I need to walk in this life. The question I have to ask you then is, Are you allowing God to direct your steps? Because if you're not, it's a very lonely place to walk because we forget the path in which we're walking because we have no light to where we're going to walk to. Jesus is that light for us. He's the path. David was confident, not only in his present circumstances. We don't know exactly what David was facing during the moment, but we know he was facing something. But of God's grace that would lead him all the way home. And God is going to take us through this. And James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have its perfect worth, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. David stayed close because he trusted in God, and he knew he was always going to be present. All because David could say, The Lord is my shepherd. Again, I want to ask you that question. Is God your shepherd? Is he the one that's walking with you? If God were to return today, could you say beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would be with him in eternity? Because if you can't put certainties upon that statement, then you haven't put your trust in God. I know we're all struggling right now. We're all somewhat in the same boat, so to speak. More areas are hit harder than others. And as we watch the news, it brings about nothing but more anxieties and more uncertainties and more problems and more woes. But sometimes I find myself having to turn the TV off and just simply reading God's Word because I know in that I find comfort. Right now it feels as if the color has been drained out of life. And I know it's easy for us to look in other directions than to God. And perhaps there are even the cynics and the critics out there who say, if God is your God, where is He right now? This is not God's problem, this is man's problem. And so when we think about that, perhaps we feel drained and downcast Can I encourage you then to fix your eyes on Jesus, to look to Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of the throne of God. During difficult times, can you say you look to the cross of Calvary? So for just a moment, I want you to do something with me. I want you to take your eyes off of all of your problems and everything that you're facing right now, and I want you to simply focus upon the cross of Calvary. And I want you to think about Jesus as he's walking through the streets, as he's in pain and agony because of the scourging and the beating that he's just gone through, those things and events that had just taken place. And as he's having to carry this cross so weak and drained of not being, having eaten and being beaten and being sleep deprived and all of these different things, how someone else has to help him carry that cross. And as he's walking to Calvary, keep your eyes on the cross. And as Jesus gets to Calvary and they stretch him out over that piece of wood because of what you and I did to him, keep your eyes on the cross. And as they pound those nails through his hands and through his feet, keep your eyes on the cross. And as they lift that cross up and as we hear Jesus groan through Scripture and he's suspended between heaven and earth between two thieves, remember this, God said no to his son so that he could say yes to us in times of distress. And so as we're struggling right now, and I know that everyone is, that we have to continue to keep our eyes on the cross of Calvary. Can I encourage you to fix your eyes on Christ today? Stick close to Him, to put your trust in Him. And even though this path in the valley seems unfamiliar right now because none of us have ever been here, I know as we get through the valley and as we're walking through the valley that God is with us and knowing as we begin to climb the mountain as one day we'll stand upon that peak, as one day we can all be back together again, as one day that we can rejoice in knowing of what God has done for us, that we could look back and say that God was with us every step of the way. Today I want to ask you, are you struggling in your faith as a Christian? Perhaps at home 
as you're sitting there watching this today, you've asked yourself questions as we've gone through these anxious times, and maybe you've questioned your faith. Maybe you haven't put your trust in who God is. And so today I want to encourage you to pray to God and ask for forgiveness. If you need prayers, if you want us to pray for you, I encourage you to email me at minister at carrycoc.org. Or I encourage you to, to go through our webpage to get my phone number and call me. And I would be happy to say a prayer with you over the phone. I would be happy to encourage you. If you know someone who's also struggling in their faith, I encourage you as a family, Carrie, to reach out to that individual, to pick them up. But also just because of these anxious and difficult times, this distress that we're going through, to make sure that you're looking out for each other anyway that we're calling each other, that we're texting each other because we need each other as a family right now. And so if you're struggling, if you need prayers, I encourage you to go to God. If you're watching this today and you're not a Christian and you have questions about your salvation, if you're scared as most of us are and you want to know what your eternity holds, I encourage you first and foremost to go to his word. And I want to give you that simple plan that God gives us that we might be saved by. And I want you to write these verses down, and I want you to read them for yourself. And as you read these verses, I want you to ask yourself this question, have I done those things that God requires of me? And if you haven't, if you're ready to, to make that step in knowing that your salvation is in jeopardy because you know you're outside of Christ, but you want to be part of Christ, then I encourage you today to contact me, to email me, Again, at minister at carrycoc.org. You can call us here at the church building, and if we don't answer, leave a message. We'll call you back. But we want you to know that if you need to be saved, if you know that you're not in a right place, we don't want you to put it off any longer. The Bible tells us for us to be saved, for us to be in God's presence, for us to walk with Him, for Him to be with us as we walk through the difficulties of this life. He tells us that we've got to hear the Word. Well, you've done that today. But not only must we hear it, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We've got to believe it in our hearts, knowing that it's true, that it makes us complete, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible tells us, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 15 and 16. So if you believe what, you, what you've read, if you understand it to be God's true message to you, the next step is God instructs us to remove our past. Well, we do that by repenting of our past. We've got to change the direction that we're walking. If I want to walk with God, I've got to be with Him, but I've got to put away the person who I used to be. And perhaps today as you watch this, you're thinking about the person that you are now is not who you want to be in the future, that you want to change these things. Maybe these times are scaring you, and I understand that, and I'm with you. But know this, if you're struggling in your salvation... And you know that you need to be with God because you're afraid that you don't know where you stand with Him. The Bible tells us we've got to repent of our past, Luke 13, 3. Jesus said, unless we repent, we're going to perish. And I don't want anybody to perish. And if you're watching this and you think your past is keeping you from salvation, if you're struggling in sin, if you'll simply give it all to God. And He says, if you'll confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with your mouth confession is made into salvation, that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll stand before God and I'll pronounce you not guilty. And that final step that puts us into Christ, into His body, is baptism. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 38. The Bible records for us where Peter preached to those individuals who asked, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And Peter simply said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. The ephesos, the removal of your past. And so God is going to wash you clean so that when you stand to walk as a new creature, as that water has washed away your sins and you're buried with Christ in baptism, you're a new creature in Christ. You put on a new person. You don't have to look over your shoulder anymore. You can find confidence in knowing in these times that God is walking with you, that you can lean upon God, that you can pray to God, that you can ask God for guidance and help in these uncertain times. And so I encourage you to do those things today if you're struggling, if you need help, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, please reach out. Please know that we're here for you. The elders would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. We just want you to know that we're here with you every step of the way. Thank you for watching today. 
And again, if you have any need at all, please let us know. In just a few moments, we're going to be led in a few more songs and another closing prayer. And I want you to know that you're in my prayers, your family's in my prayers, and may God continue to bless you. 714. 714. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for the Thirteen, then we'll be dismissed with a prayer. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's stand as we say. He took my burdens all away.
us pray. Lord God, we bow before you humbly, thankfully, at your throne, Lord. We place all of our concerns, our worries, our anxieties at your feet, knowing that we have hope in you and your love for us as demonstrated by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to always know and never doubt and understand, Lord, to live our lives without fear. Give us the strength daily to set the best example to those around us, those of the members of faith and those outside of the faith, Lord, that we can be that shining example during this time. Give us the strength, Lord, always to never forget all that you do for us, have done for us, and will do for us. Please, Lord God, bless our elders, strengthen them, guide them, love them, watch over them and protect them, Lord, during this time as they guide us and shepherd us, Lord. Bless our deacons, bless our song leaders, bless our teachers, bless those that serve you, Lord, daily in all that they do to further your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to not retract but to extend out each opportunity that we have to be a shining light to point the way to you to everlasting salvation. Help us to always know, Lord, that we are loved. Help us to never forget that we have love to give to those around us. And we love you, Father. Protect us, Lord, in all that we do. May it honor you and your son's sacrifice. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.